Hi, can you hear me? Great. So as developers, we ask ourselves a lot like what motivates us. Like our salary probably serves our basic needs. So we have food, we have an apartment, and so everything kind of is great. Um, there's actually some kind um, of idea um, from uh, Daniel Pink's uh, book Drive. Um, so what motivates us? So one thing is sure like autonomy. That's why we have like the self-organized teams and we work in Scrum. So the other thing is probably mastery. So we don't want to work on something that's too easy, but we also don't want to work on something that's too hard. That's also why we automate the things that are very easy. Um, and the third thing is that we want to have some kind of purpose, some kind of goal, also which also kind of drives team, team spirit and um, we want to know what we do. Um, so this talk is about more on this point. So I want to go in deeper like um, what, um, how do we verify that what we do is great. So um, my talk is about A-B testing. So today I will give you an introduction to A-B testing. My name is Yalina. And I'm the CTO at Wondertax, which is a small startup in Berlin doing some, something with taxes <laughs> in Germany as well. Um, yeah, so let's start from the beginning. So uh, what, what is an A-B test? So um, I think most of you already know this, um, but just to like give a small recap. So an A-B test basically is like, so you have a randomly distributed group of uh, people and you show one group, one variation, like which is A, and one variation is B. Usually, you like the first variation is the control group, and the second variation is something new. And then you like track both of them to a certain goal. So um, let's say people who saw um, the control group converted 25%, and people who saw the B group um, 50%, what is, what is the most important thing here is that that your group is like randomly distributed. Like if you pick the users and show them a version depending on some trait they have, then this is um, of course not randomly. <laughs> so, um, so, but what, so I said like, okay, there are 25% conversion and there are 55, 50% conversion, but how can I know that? So actually, um, I just give you like a very like rough introduction in that topic, but we should also talk a bit about significance because it's important um, to understand like um, A-B test results. So to not to go too far, <laughs> I just want to focus on some. Um, so basically, uh, maybe some of you already seen this, but there is like the standard normal curve, um, which kind of shows you like when when the when the conversion that you are measuring is kind of in here, like where the middle is, then um, how, where would be the real conversion rate, right? So we are always interested, like, um, how sure are we that our real conversion rate lies in a certain interval? Um, so I want to take this on an example because that's easier, I think, to understand. So let's say I have um, an A-B test um, and I have like um, a sample size of 1,000. So 1,000 people saw version A and 1,000 saw version B. And the uh, like measured uh, conversion rate is 50% and 55% for the other one. So then I have something like this basically. So the left one is my, my um, A group and the right one is the B group and now to kind of have an idea like, um, so I want to know is like this 55% group is it performing better um, than the control group or how sure am I that this is the way it is. So um, just like to give you a rough idea about it. So we kind, of, we kind of calculate the standard error for this and then at the end what you try to want to achieve is that that you can kind of like fill in the area and you want to fill in 95% of that area usually. I mean, you can also fill in 99, it's even better. Um, but let's say we want to reach 95%, which is also fine. Then we know like there is some crazy calculation going on there. But basically, I think it's graphically a little hard to see. But so here it's kind of where, where there is kind of a line, let's say. Um, so where I filled out like this part, like by 95%, and also this part, 
and they are not overlapping. So that means, basically, it doesn't mean, so this is, I think, also the most important takeaway here. So it doesn't mean that we like uplifted our conversion rate by 10%. The only thing that we know is that by 95%, I mean, if we did the test also in the right way, we are sure that um, the, the, the new version is probably performing better than the old. I mean, the real conversion rate could also be here. I, we don't know. <laughs> it's just a guess. So this is also important to know. We don't know, we are not sure that it's like this high lift because these are just two um, example measurements that we took. Okay. So if you want to do this by yourself, you can also read some nice books about statistics, about binomial distribution, or you just use this calculator, which also helps a lot. Um, yeah. So this is the what is an A-B test and what is what is roughly behind. But now I want to talk about um, why why you should A-B test. Um, so I think the major thing is that market conditions change. So let's say you develop a feature in November. Yeah, that's a crazy thing. Everybody believes really in this feature and you just implement and then you are like measuring, measuring, whoa, and there's a real big conversion lift. But then, oh, yeah, of course, it's Christmas, so maybe that is where the conversion lift comes from. So you have seasonal changes, you have weather, you have a lot of things you just don't know. Like maybe you will never know, like a lot of, so the, the quality of your traffic, of the people who are visiting is changing and also they behave much different, especially if you have seasons, um, and especially web apps are very, I don't know, but I can say that they are very heavily depending on the weather. Um, <laughs> so this is the most important reason why you should A-B test, because you cannot be sure about like a certain change that you did that it overperformed otherwise. So only this can be the real proof. Everything else is just random guesses. Um, the other thing is that you have unbiased results. So of course, you should do a lot of qualitative research about everything, more or less, but you also have to like ask yourself, okay, maybe you like and did a good user test, the results were also good, and then, I don't know, maybe you like invited only men to your user test and then realizing, oh, 80% of your traffic are female and then, whoops, everything changes and Kind of this, so there is like there's just a bias always, also with with qualitative. So it doesn't mean that you should not do qualitative analysis, but you should use um, A/B test to verify um, your um, assumptions. So um, the other important part is that yeah, I mean with every kind of testing, you learn a lot about your product and your customers. So it's a really great chance, a really great chance to learn more. And then, of course, numbers, like you, you want um, less, less hippos, so you don't want then somebody decides, oh, um, let's do this and that feature because we think it's so important. Um, you can always like challenge this and it's always better with numbers. So, and as said, A-B tests are um, a good way to have good numbers. Um, and usually hippos love numbers, so if you give them numbers, then they will probably be happy. Um, another important thing is that it's also about you, a lot about you. Like, I also come to this part much later again. But um, you have to learn that a lot of things that you think are right are just wrong. And it's actually something really good. So you will kind of get in the mood of kill your darlings. So meaning you will be more objective and less attached to certain things. So and ideally, you also have like, it's actually a star um, background, but you have a clear product, hopefully, because everything that doesn't create value, you just throw it away. Which is also, of course, can be said sometimes, but this is how it works. And yeah, ultimately, you make money. <laughs> so how to A-B test? So actually, this is the shortest part because it's super simple. <laughs> so first of all, I mean, probably you all know like this kind of um, landing page creators where you can build pages and they already have built in um, some way of A-B testing. Also a lot of like 
email stuff, they all have this already built in, so you just have to can use it out of the box for landing pages, and landing pages also make a lot of sense to have A-B tests, but um, there are actually a lot more things you should A-B test, so I will like go into a little bit in Ruby and Rails, <laughs> because we are in a Ruby user group today. So there is like this one gem I really like, which um, actually a friend of mine developed. Um, I will just give you like a really rough introduction because it's very, very simple. So to set up an A-B test, you basically declare it once. You put in some metadata. So in this case, I wanted to t test something on the home page and want to show like different, different images, let's say. So I um, do this once. Then I have some part of the code where I like um, depending on the vari variant I'm in, I want to show like different content. Maybe I created like a homepage background helper and just show different backgrounds. So I can use um, this in the view or in the controller. Um, and then, so this is part one. So I differ between the different version versions. Then the second part is I of course need to track my conversion. So I need to track the sessions and I need to track the successes. So to track the uh, views, I basically do this. So I just track view <laughs> on the experiment I want to track it. In my case, as I said, like it's some kind of home page. So I'm doing this. Um, and then I do more or less the same when I say um, um, on sign up, which is also some other action where I then track the success. So this is everything more or less. Then you get something like this. So um, you get um, an overview about your different tests and the different groups. And then you have, so the most important part is like you can have um, views, sessions, success, and conversions. Views and successes are triggered on the different code parts. But of course, um, you differ not between like maybe somebody refreshed the home page 10 times, but you don't, you track only one session, right? So. You also want to just take one session, or maybe somebody signed up three times. I don't know why, but maybe. <laughs> and you also just track this as one success. So, and then finally, you end up with some conversion rate. And as I showed before, then you do some mathematics to calculate like your confidence level that, for example, version B is performing better than the control group. And here you get 99%. And then you say, yay, let's move to this and let's do the next A B test. So there are also a lot of others, um, um, Ruby um, AB tools. So one is split. I also should look at this. this is probably the most maintained one and the biggest one. There's also Vanity, which is also a bit bigger. So this is about how to implement it, which is just a really small part. Um, so then the next question is like, what should we test? So I mean, everybody has some kind of funnel, I guess. So you have some somebody coming in and then at the end probably converting in some customers. So as I showed before um, in the calculation, so you need actually a lot of traffic to have results fast. So in order to have this, you should um, always um, start like with um, the most, let's say, with the top funnel steps. So that's why a lot of people do homepage tests because there you just have like the traffic you need. It depends a lot about your product um, and how much traffic you have. There's also a, a tool, I think I linked it later actually, um, which you can use to kind of determine how many days it will might take for your A-B test to be finished. Um, but yeah, so this is also like, that's why I think always about your funnel um, and what to test first. So. So what should you test? So you can basically test everything. Emails you can test as well. Basically you can test like every new feature, like let's say you implement a new payment provider because everybody in the company wants it, but you should kind of know why you implemented it, right? You wanted to implement it to reach more customers. So you should test this. So basically you should just simply everywhere where you can but there are, um, yeah, what it is. Um, so how to set up an A-B test. 
So first, um, use data to identify problems and opportunities. I think this is clear, like you do user interviews, you do some quantitative data research, um, heat maps, all these things. Then you build some kind of um, hypothesis um, that where you create a um, fix for this, like you, you um, create some solution. Um, and this solution, you should also pre-validate. So pre-validating means user testing and everything. And when you think this is a good approach and you iterate it as many times as you could, then you test it. And ideally, you, you test big changes first because you're probably not Amazon, or I mean, I don't know what kind of websites you have, but <laughs> probably just changing like a button color. I mean, depends on your business, of course, but doesn't make this big difference, I guess. So now I am, um, I want also like to give you like a rough overview about like my key learnings when I, when I um, did a lot of A-B tests right now. So the most important one, I think this is something you should always do, like analyze your funnel. So understand like where you can test easily and where are the biggest opportunities in, in terms of conversion rate, like if you're, first funnel step is already 90% conversion rate, maybe there is not so, such a big opportunity. But if you have another step that only converts 10%, maybe problematic. So start there. Um, yeah, I already mentioned this, so you have to be prepared that what you think is wrong. It's just the way, like, I had this so many times where we thought, whoa, this, this will work, like, conversion will go crazy, but no. <laughs> Maybe was even, even make it worse. Yeah, so this is this is a kind of conflict actually, and this is always where you have to balance. So you should not have small changes, but on the other hand, you should also not um, think that your small change doesn't have a big impact because you really don't know this. So this is kind of the trickiest part, and actually the thing I'm mostly struggling with because um, because. I mean, of course, the better you understand your customer, the better you can calculate this. But maybe a really tiny change that you think is a tiny change is maybe a big change for the customer. So this was the tricky part because it's very subjective what a small change is, right? Um, yeah, I think this is obvious. So document, document all your tests. So share it with everybody in the company because maybe in six months you don't know what you tested before and you should document all the results. Ideally, also what the document, also what you exactly tested. Um, yeah, avoid parallel testing. Like there are some people say you can do parallel testing, some people say you can't. Um, there are some drawbacks, and uh, you can do it with some kind of. Um, but if you really want parallel testing, rather create more variance or wait until the test finishes. This is most of the times the better approach if you can avoid it. Yeah, so this is actually also, I think, um, an important thing. Like I mentioned all these landing page generators, but there are obviously some uh, drawbacks here. So first of all, like um, if you use client-side A-B tests, you have, they call it like flicker effect, but just imagine you show a certain element on the website um, on and off, you will have with JavaScript some kind of flickering. So on one variation you will pop up or will not be visible and then suddenly pop up. There's actually a really funny experiment um, of some people who wanted to test their price with client side. And what they ended up actually is creating a JavaScript animation who would strike through the price because they saw with this flicker effect there was actually, but this is actually the exception. So usually it rather creates more problems than solutions. So um, you should um, better go, um, so this is why, so you have once the Flickr problem, then let's say you maybe did a change that made your website 10 times lower. <laughs> then, of course, like when you do client-side testing, um, I mean 10 times lower on the client-side, let's say, then when you um, execute JavaScript, maybe you don't track even the user because you already bounced and said, no, that's not what I wanted. And you don't have to, and maybe this page is performed then much better for the rest of the users, but at the end, maybe it was much worse. So that's why server-side testing is just a little bit more resilient. Yep. 
Um, yeah, and also, this is also, I think, always an important learning. Um, so let's say there is a legal change and you have to do this one thing. Like, there is no way that you don't put this checkbox somewhere or whatever. So I think this happens a lot of time, but usually you say, yeah, okay, it drops the conversion. But you also, you want to get a feeling, like, how much does it drop? And can I create maybe a variation that, that is not so bad? And so this is also important, like, even when you know you have to do these kind of things, maybe you should still validate them so you know also how your customers uh, think about it. Yeah, and there's also a trap. Um, I call it, let's just test the trap. So, um, of course, like when you introduce A-B test, probably everybody in your company probably will say, ah, let's just A-B test this and that. And of course, you should still kind of put some sense into it. Like, you should not, I don't know, put uh, flying unicorns on your website just because just test it, maybe it works. I mean, maybe it's a good idea if you sell unicorns, but, I mean, just just kind of think about it um, still in a decent way. So use user tests and user research to really um, also give some arguments to the choices because a B test can take a while and you just don't want to like block too much time. Yeah, so what you cannot test, um, actually I think, um, so yeah, I think it's clear that like B2B business are very hard to test because you have so low traffic and actually your customers just write you directly what they want and you have some kind of other relationship I guess with them. Um, and also like back offices and all the stuff you probably would not test because of the traffic but I think qualitative feedback in this way is also enough. Yeah, and tiny changes you can also not test. But also, this is also like one of the biggest questions. So why would you do tiny changes if they don't affect anything? So there is kind of this, why do you even do it? Then don't do tiny changes. Just, just skip them, only do things that have impact, right? So I know it's hard, but sometimes it's better. But of course, there are always limitations, and it's also important to know all of them. So the biggest problem with A-B testing is like this local versus global maximum problem. So let's say you like build the perfect landing page and you are here. And every change that you do, like every time change to improve it will bring you here. So you can only make it worse. This is problematic and you, at some point you will reach that point. And then it's pretty tricky like to still have in mind there is somewhere like the global maximum, which is the best thing that you can build. And if you end up doing two small changes, um, you, you won't re get here, right? So also combinations can have a different impact than, than just one change. And this is really hard like to understand, but I think so also be careful and if you get to this point and everything that you do is worse then you probably reach the local maximum and then just go for something crazy different maybe or don't do anything if it's already great just keep it and at the end just like do user testing and um, use like user feedback yeah anyway even with all the concerns, I just would recommend you like to start to A-B test because also they make your life much better at work because you really know what you are doing um, and what impact it has. It's simple to implement, like I think like the technical like implications are so low so you can just uh, start and learn about your customers and yeah, thank you. Okay, are there any questions? Okay. I have a question about these big changes that you supposed to test. What about the costs of development? Because if you have if you want to change like a main feature of your app or just you know, re redesign main feature of your app, the and it's complicated I don't know, complicated part of the app is the development of two separate views. Uh, cost a lot of money in like development work. So what about this? If you, you think it's uh, when it's uh, profitable to actually uh, do it. Yeah, 
I think, yeah, I think, so one thing is that it's kind of not clear like what small changes are. I mean, this is actually a buzzword because of what I mean, like maybe it's a small change technical wise, but it has a huge impact, right? So it's, I think then doesn't need to be a correlation between like, um, so this is the first thing. And then the second thing is like, yeah, it's actually quite hard um, to test all this stuff and to implement um, things, but I think you also can like strive like always for the leanest approach. I made this example, for example, with the payment provider. So I would not recommend you to like just implement a payment provider, right? I would, imp I would probably uh, recommend you to put the icon of the payment provider on your product page and see if this changes something. So that would be the leanest approach, right? It would be super less. And you still, of course, you should still validate the whole thing, but yeah, I think there needs always to be some kind of, but it's of course not, um, especially when it comes to like um, this bigger visual changes, this of course like can be more more effort, but the other problem is if they are too small the changes, then you just don't see the impact. Okay, any other questions? So regarding parallel testing, uh, if you have two places on the website that you want to change and you want to A-B test and you want to test them at the same time, so you want to do parallel testing or you, you or maybe you have to do parallel testing, like you cannot do it differently. What kind of numbers of, uh, or what kind of increase in numbers of visits, conversions, do you need to have a statistically similar confidence level? Like what's the kind of growth? Is it exponential or is it, uh, I don't know, square or linear? Yeah, so the problem with parallel testing is, so let's say you have two steps in your funnel where you have, on each step you have a test, right? Okay, so then the ideal, like, as the traffic is randomly distributed, so you will still get on the second funnel, you will still get, like, you have actually four different variants there. Like, you have the ones who have both, one, only one, and so on. And you have all the combinations, and ideally, like, in a, in a shared traffic. So the problem is when you have two tests, actually, it creates some noise, and you will see the noise in the conversion rate. So it will actually be more, um, less significant. So maybe the real conversion rate would be that, but because you have the other test, kind of that. So it kind of, yeah, it actually I think I don't have like a clear number, but it will, it will make the duration of your test until they are significant higher. Yeah, because the question is how do you separate, because then you get results of like four different, uh, you, get, you really get the results of four different combinations, like I don't know, like first page shows A and second page shows B, and then what kind of numbers do you need to actually separate that the change A was the thing that drove more conversions? Uh, because you have like two different cases with change A and, and, not, and, and it wasn't uh, a matter of change B. Yeah, so I mean it's hard, but as I said, like they're actually randomly distributed still and if you have a decent sample size, um, it will just take more time at the end. It's the same, let's say, you could also create four variants, the ones that I just mentioned and test like until you could you could still have one test. I mean, how you define the funnel is up to you, right? So I can also define the funnel and say, okay, maybe I just test like the whole thing and I create four variations. So one is like it was before, one is with the first and second and so on, and I have four variations and that's the problem. So four variations, of course, like they take just much longer time to have final results. So that's why I say like, the problem with parallel testing is that at the end, you have all like your two results much later, and that's a problem because you want to learn fast, right? So, doesn't yeah, but it's tricky. I would, if you can, try to avoid it. Test the most important change first. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Once again. Thank you.